Welcome to Disrupting Japan. Straight talk from Japan's most successful entrepreneurs. I'm Tim Romero, and thanks for joining me. Today, we're going to talk about fusion energy. Now, for the past several decades, fusion has been touted as the best possible solution to the world's energy needs. It's a promise of clean, safe, inexpensive, and virtually limitless energy. So, what's not to love? Of course, making that dream a reality is not exactly a simple matter. Today, we sit down with Satoshi Konishi, founder and CEO of Kyoto Fusioneering, and we talk about the state of fusion energy today, the problems that still need to be solved. And the role that startups have to play in making fusion energy a commercial reality. And if during our interview it sounds like I'm sometimes kind of bubbling over in geeky excitement, well, it's because I am. Fusion energy is something that's fascinated me since I was in high school. It's just such an interesting and important set of technologies. And it's some genuinely cool physics as well. Anyway, Satoshi and I dig into both the history of fusion power and the current challenges being faced by both universities and startups alike in bringing it to commercialization. Why the most viral headlines about fusion energy tend to be really misleading. What's needed for more effective public-private partnerships in fusion, and of course. We also dive into how Satoshi sees fusion energy developing over the next ten years, and the real trigger that will determine when and if we will see a world powered by fusion. But you know, Satoshi tells that story much better than I can. So let's get right to the interview. So I'm sitting here with Satoshi Konishi. Of Kyoto Fusioneering, who's working with researchers and startups around the world to make fusion energy a reality. So, thanks so much for sitting down with us. I'm very happy to、uh, just talk with you. Thank you very much. Well, it's it's my pleasure. And and before we get deep into the the fusion technology, my understanding is that Kyoto Fusioneering's focus is on. The materials and the precision engineering that are needed for fusion research. Yeah, that is、uh, partially true. But what we intend to do ultimately is that to make the entire fusion plant to make a fusion energy. But what makes fusion energy well is、uh, not a resource, but a small amount of hydrogen. But big machines、uh, very precisely made. So we need special materials. We need special fabrication technology. We have a very precise assembling, and we also have to be very careful to make the plant to be safe. So everything just needs a very careful, very dedicated, sometimes exotic technologies. Everything needed for fusion energy is our business. Well, that that's what I find so fascinating. So, so much of fusion research is really everyone is building their own components. Everyone is is、yep. you know on the cutting edge of of research. Yes. But Kyoto Fusioneering is not only doing the research and, and developing this, but you're actually selling these components to other researchers, right? Yes, because our company is still small. We still have about、um, a little over a hundred people. That is not a huge, huge company, so that we can start when the sales of the say a、uh, small piece of the material, small device to facilitate the fusion experiment. And at the other end of our business, we provide a consultation: how we can make the fusion plant to be safe. How we can evaluate the value of the fusion energy economically? So the kind of the consultation again does not need a fortune to to spend. So tell me about your customers. Who are they? Are they research labs? Are they universities? Are they other fusion startups? Yes,、uh, we do have business with all of the customers.、Uh, as you have suggested, we just. Work with the universities, the researchers, small business,、uh, mid-sized, big companies, and even for the national project. Everywhere that they are pursuing a fusion, we can provide materials, component, design, and the consultations. 
And before we dive into the energy, I want to talk a little bit about you. Myself? <laughs> yes. You've been involved with fusion research for a, for a long time now, right? Yep. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, I'm sorry to say that I have spent uh, four decades, 45 years almost, on fusion. Well, actually, and let's clear that up for our listeners that fusion being used to produce energy is not new. The, the first reactors were in the, the 1950s, I think. Ah, yes. And uh, believe it or not, fusion was found earlier than the fusion. Really? Yes, some smart guy had found that the sun is burning uh, by the fusion energy and also fusion reaction to make the hydrogen atoms get together makes energy. That was also found in 1930s. So very many people have known it for a long time. But the, like the first fusion reactors, the first Takamak reactors, were in the 50s, right? Or was it before that? Uh, yes, even before that, people started to uh, try the fusion uh, by making uh, some kinds of plasma discharge. Uh, back in the 90, maybe uh, late 40s or early, early 50s. And Tokamak was one of the early inventions. But before Tokamak came, Americans had started to uh, study uh, the discharge machine that was called pinch or sterilator. And there are very many different types of plasma devices that intended to make a fusion energy to be real. So why was there relatively little progress, or at least the public is not aware of much progress, well, over the last 60 years? Uh, <laughs> that is uh, partially our fault, but it's, uh, no, not our fault. And we made a progress, but the just target was a little too far than we have expected. Well, a little more difficult. It was a little too distant. But now we are approaching the real top now, yes. So, so yes, yeah, so what's led to this sudden, seemingly sudden, what, what's led to this recent interest and excitement about fusion then? That does not come from the technical scientific reason that we believe that the technical scientific progress has been a kind of steady. Yes, as you say, sometimes it stopped, sometimes that was fast, sometimes slow. But one of the big steps that we are experiencing now comes from the business world, not the science. So businessmen are aware that now that we can no longer burn oils and coals and other fossil fuels. In the recent, say, 10 years or so, that we are aware now that we will not run out of fossil fuels, but run out of the room for the carbon dioxide emission. I see. Actually, getting back to your own experience, so you're, you're a professor at Kyoto University and Kyoto Fusioneering was spun out of Kyoto University about five years ago? Four and a half, yes. October 2019. And the startup and the university, are they still doing joint research? Are there research agreements or IP sharing agreements in place between them? It's uh, collaborating with the universities and other top-level researchers in the world is one of our major missions still. Is there ever any any conflict between the, the pure research and the startup side. And what, what I mean by that is the pure research is all about sharing and being open and publishing results. And on the startup side, it's a lot about engineering and intellectual property and trade secrets. Do you ever find those in conflict? I do not really believe so. There are certainly some kind of difference of the view on discoveries, the scientific achievement, but we are very keen to publish our findings to, to the public in, in academic conferences and journals. And uh, yeah, there are something that we have to just keep as uh, intellectual property for sure because we are, we are spending our money for that. But the discovery to make our finding to be available for all the researchers to, to make a much faster progress. So we are not hiding much. Only just a small part of the key of the technology that is that intellectual property to be protected. How do you focus on what's going to be protected and what's going to be shared? How do you make that determination? For instance, if we have invented a new material that would survive in a very harsh environment in the fusion device, the material itself, its content even, is not a secret. We report it in the academic meetings. But how to make it, 
That stability is a kind of a secret. And also the supply chain, who can prepare the high purity of the material, how we can control the quality and how we can fabricate that. That kind of you know, supply chain organization is our property. That makes a lot of sense. Another thing I want to ask, you've been very successful with fundraising. You've raised uh, around $100 million altogether. You've got, as you mentioned, a little over 100 staff. But startups like Kyoto Fusioneering, the, these, these really ambitious, capital-intensive, moonshot startups, often really struggle to find venture capital investment. So can you tell me about the kinds of investors that you attracted to Kyoto Fusioneering? That is a good question. Actually, I'm an academic person and I'm not quite good in fundraising itself. So the, the most important secret of mine is that we could find a good people to organize a fundraising team. Actually, the one thing that made us uh, successful so far, we appreciate the understanding by our investors very much. One of the reasons we have been successful and make us understood is simply because we have been very technically honest. We have been very careful in explaining the status of the fusion technology in a very detail. One of the reasons I believe that our communication with the investors has been uh, very successful. Well, let, let's talk a bit about the, the business side of things and, and the business model. Uh, you know, obviously, there's a huge number of engineering challenges involved with building fusion plants. And, and as I understand it, there are three core components that you are focusing on. Yes, so we are focused on a three technology field. One is a plasma heating device. Before starting the old plasma, experiment that we have to have the hot plasma to uh, to start its ignition so we have to heat it to a million of degrees so that is not, not the easy temperature to achieve and we have one of the best researchers and engineers and fabrication team for plasma heating device the name of that device is gyrotron and that has originally been an invention of, by uh, Russians, but Japanese companies has made a very good technology to make it work at a very high performance with a good reliability. And we are providing plasma heating device technology to our customers. And the thick and the third are coming together. We are trying to make a fusion energy conversion to make plasma energy into uh, the electricity or heat or hydrogen or other forms of energy. So that is the system that we call the thermal cycle because fusion makes uh, heat as a primary energy and that should be converted to a more consumer-friendly form. And the other is a fuel cycle. Plasma is fed by the hydrogen isotope to continue to burn, but after that we have to treat the exhaust gas Unfortunately, the plasma burning is not very efficient. More than 90% of the plasma will not burn and just exhaust it. We have to recycle it to continue its burning. So those are two systems. Some cycles and fuel cycles are inevitable for any kind of fusion experiment. And so before coming to the commercial fusion energy, many fusion researchers, many fusion companies will have to have those two systems. So we are providing that technology to start a hot plasma and thermal cycle and the fuel cycle. Those three technologies we are currently providing. I'm just fascinated by this balance between the research and the engineering challenges. So, I mean, obviously these three components, uh, the plasma heating, the thermal cycle, the fuel cycle are essential for any fusion reactor. But with the state of the art changing so quickly, with designs and materials changing as new research evolves, how do you decide how to commit engineering resources to this? So, if you're developing, say, just for example, the plasma heating system, and new innovation happens in another research lab, how much do you have to retool? That really is a good question. I have to say, any of those technologies are not completed yet, and we still have to make considerable progress. Even for the gyrotron, gyrotron itself is in a good maturity, but we have to make it more powerful, that should run a little longer, and it should be a little more 
power efficient and also a little cheaper. Some of our competitors will also have to make a progress. So the if we would just stop our development, we will be left behind very quickly. So we have to continue to compete and toward the goal of the realistic and commercial available machine. So that we are still on the way. So, for example, I, I've noticed that you're a supplier to both the UK's Atomic Energy Authority and to the ITER project. So the equipment you would supply those two organizations would be different versions of the same. Would it be the same machines or they'd be kind of different versions of the same machines, depending on when it's ordered and what it integrates with? So though they're the currently designed machines, so our current technology can respond to the request. But a real commercial fusion plant would be something beyond that. So we have to improve the, all of those technologies. A little more higher performance, a little more improved form. Everything's step by step. Yes. We do not in the quantum jump of technology. What we need is just a patient development to make the performance better and better. And uh, we have a very strong feeling that we can achieve this technology goal in a reasonable time. That's awesome. And, and actually, let's, let's talk about that, because I, I want you to help me clear up something to our listeners that the press seems to be really confused about. Over the last year, we've seen a lot of headlines about finally getting more energy out of the reaction that we're putting in. But, but this is just the, the plasma efficiency or the fusion Q, and, and things are actually a lot more complicated than that. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for raising the point. Probably you understand uh, much better than the average understanding about the fusion that the you know, large Q is one of the parameters that we often use, but we have to just explain it a little more. We have energy multiplication. If we put one energy that we expect five to ten times larger energy coming out, but currently that ratio is about one to one or slightly above one. So we have to make it five to ten times. Uh, in the case of uh, the laser fusion, we also have to make it much larger because the laser itself needs the electricity to make a light uh, photon energy. So we have to make the ratio ten times, hundred times larger. Well, and, and it goes back to like every single one of those components, those core components you mentioned, the, the, the heating the plasma, the whole fuel cycle, the thermal cycle, each of those has its own efficiencies. Each of those has its own either energy requirements or energy losses. It is not perfect. We can simply just improve those efficiency, improve this multiplication amplitude of the input to output energy ratio. You were mentioning before like 10 or 20, but I, I want to, I know so companies like Kyoto Fusioneering are working on getting the, the plasma heating more efficient, the thermocycling more efficient. So efficiencies are improving. So what what are the final Q values that we're targeting before things will be commercially viable? If we're we're around one now, where do you think we'll need to be before we see commercial production? Be at least maybe five. So we can make a reasonable energy output output to sell. But in any process of energy generation we always have to discard about half or two-thirds of its energy as a waste heat. So that we need uh, at least uh, maybe five to ten times larger energy if we would like to have a meaningful net output of electricity to sell. We don't have to have a hundred times, a thousand times larger, but at least we have to have five to ten times. Let's talk a bit about... Japan and the state of fusion research and fusion startups in Japan, because it, it seems that there's a lot of really interesting things going on here right now. I mean, there's obviously what you and Kyoto Fusioneering are doing. X Fusion is starting up. There's helical fusion as well. And, and I'm curious, what was the trigger that led to this, this cluster of fusion startups in Japan? We still are far behind other more advanced countries like US or UK, where much more fusion startups are actively working. We still have on only several, below five. 
One of the reasons that we had a very strong national program, and still it is quite active. We have made a good progress in the technological development, mainly by public sectors focus on either and also the so-called broader approach that is a collaboration with the Europeans working toward a demo plan beyond either. Those are the very strong public programs. And we did have a very small university research activities that has always been a very good quality. So both of the technologies, big public sectors, research works, and small university researches, they have forced our companies to come out. But still, we did not have a very strong reason to make small private fusion companies in Japan. But now things are changing, that we are now heading to a little earlier, a little smaller, a little faster fusion development led by private activities. And what about the Japanese public attitude towards fusion? Japan famously has kind of a nuclear allergy on fission reactions. Does that extend at all to fusion or? I do not think so. Yes, there are some people that they just confuse or intentionally just mix that fission and fusion, but I do not hate fission, nuclear fusion technology. In Japan, particularly, we need nuclear energy for sure because we do not have energy resources on these small islands. But yes, we do have some, as you said, that some kinds of nuclear allergy in Japan. But that, that, that simply means that Japanese are very sensitive for safety. They're not only a nuclear technology, but also that we are very safety oriented people. You know, I believe that this country still is one of the safest countries in the world. Probably you, you would agree that. I totally agree with that, yeah. <laughs> sometimes sometimes uh, that we see uh, some exceptions, but the we are very serious in, in the safety. Fusion has been kept very safe, but unfortunately we had a very bad accident that, that caused by the tsunami and a big earthquake. I share the Japanese uh, enthusiasm to make everything safe and safer. So fusion is not exception. We have to be very careful about the fusion technology to be very safe. Looking at the road ahead, last year you announced plans to build a, an, an experimental proof of concept power station of a, of a few dozen kilowatts. Is that still in the works? Yes, we are now constructing that experimental facility in Kyoto. We do not have any fusion reactions involved. That is a thermal cycle experiment, having a simulated fusion power coming to the fusion energy converter that is called the blanket. The blanket is a device surrounding the burning plasma. And starting from the blanket, we would just circulate the heat to convert its energy to, to electricity and hydrogen. So that's the technology we are developing and demonstrating in the next three years or so. I see. So it's it's not the fusion ignition. It's improving and perfecting the thermal cycle system. And the... Exactly. But that technology is agnostic to a very many different plasma types, like lasers, like a tokamak, like stellarators. There are very many kinds of the plasma devices can be attached to our thermal cycle. So once any countries or companies would make a fusion reaction to be available for a conversion, we can provide our technology to just make the fusion energy to be supplied to the consumer. Excellent. Let me ask you, I was going to ask you these questions separately, but I think I'm going to combine them into one because I think the answers will intertwine. <laughs> okay. Can you explain your path to profitability over the next five to 10 years and explain to me how you see progress on fusion reactors moving towards commercialization over the next five to 10 years. Uh, for the next five to 10 years, I would have to explain it a little more careful. In, in the next five to 10 years, I do not believe that any of the fusion energy would really be a commercially available and competitive with uh, the current energy sources like oil or gas or just even as the wind and the solar. To compete with them uh, will not be possible in the next five to 10 years. In the next five to 10 years, I'm pretty sure that some of the fusion challenges in the world 
would declare some kinds of the successful achievement of the fusion reaction for sure. And Kyoto Fusion Yang will also provide the technology to make that kind of fusion reaction to be sustainable and to be available for the consumer product. Those kind of things would, would be achieved in the next 5-10 years. And after that, maybe a selected number of plant concept for a fusion would be the designed and start its construction for the demonstration of the actual energy supply. But before going to that stage, the competition and the development has already been started for the commercial fusion. So we have to make our fusion technology to make, you know, realistic fusion energy to be available. And that needs a supply chain, that needs a machine, that needs a plant technology. And that would give us a business chance for a Kyoto fusion energy because all those the technology development needs machines and we are providing that technology. And, and I suppose as we move forward, there's going to be a lot more standardization around best practices and engineering practices as well. Yes, but uh, currently we are enjoying our technology diversities. You know, that, that we have a very many different types of the future challenges in the world. And uh, we are trying from a little different aspect, but we are not actually competing, but we are trying the very many different types of technology and eventually maybe not very many, but the selected number of the technology would survive. So that would be a kind of a natural selection. We don't have to select only one winner. We just have two, three candidates. You know, when we have watched the nuclear fusion reactors, we did have a water cooled, we did have a gas cooled, a metal cooled, and then back in the 1950s, 60s. And we still have those technologies, but the economical winners were the light water reactors. So let me follow up, because it sounds like you were saying that we'll, we'll probably start to see some pilots and demonstration reactors in 10 to 15 years, maybe. So when do you think we'll see commercial deployment of fusion reactors? Mm, it depends on the economical situation and the energy supply situation as well. I would say that so-called pilot plant, and I don't know the real definition of those keywords. Some say it's a demo plant, some say it's a pilot plant, some say it's just commercial reactor. But the first reactors would not be very economically attractive for sure. It may cost maybe $1, $10 per kilowatt hour. Uh, so that may not be very attractive. Yeah, well, it's, it's a pilot. It's not supposed to make money, right? It's <laughs> yeah, yeah, Yes, yes. But if you remember the very first age of the video recorders or even the television set, they are awfully expensive, but some rich people started to use them. So that the first reactor, of course, would be awfully expensive. That would decrease its cost very quickly. But we do not know when competitive cost would be uh, possible for a fusion. We, we talked a bit about some misunderstandings on Q and about Japan's nuclear allergy and things. So what's the biggest misunderstandings that you think the public or investors have about fusion energy? That is a good question. That actually, that I am a specialist on the tritium. That is a radionuclide of the hydrogen. And that is one of the very infamous world because the treated water has been accumulated in the Fukushima site with one million tons of the water. But that misunderstanding about tritium is one of the things that we have to correct. We have to know that each of us have a tritium, tritium atom in our body, each of us. Tritium is the natural ingredient of our body and our environment. Some of the people say that the artificial tritium is bad and the natural <laughs> tritium, they don't care. But tritium is a tritium. And uh, we actually are just uh, living in the world full of the radiation, the radionuclide. That is one of the things we have to correct the misunderstanding. So people should have a, a little bit more nuanced understanding of what radiation is in general. Exactly, yes. So I have to say the fusion is not free from radiation. We do have a technology to control it safely. 
But we have to be careful, we have to be very serious in making a fusion reactor to be safe. Excellent. So Satoshi, before I let you go, I want to ask you what I call my magic wand question. <laughs> okay. That is, if I gave you a magic wand and I told you that you could change one thing about Japan, anything at all, the education system, the way people think about risk, people's attitudes towards science and radiation, anything at all to make it better for startups and innovation in Japan, what would you change? Well, one of the things I would just suggest is that not, it doesn't need a magic wand. It's a very simple uh, improvement. We have lots of good studies in the public research institute and the universities, and those research infrastructures are one of the things we cannot afford. We need a high voltage, high power, and a large amount of energy to just conduct our fusion experiment. That needs a fortune. And then we will need a nuclear research facilities. That is not also affordable for a small fusion startups. That is not for only fusion, but also every type of the small companies, uh, not only in Japan, but in very many places in the world. It, it seems to me like a lot of that is achieved by partnering with universities like you and the team are doing. Exactly. So we have enjoyed the partnership and the collaboration with, with the university, but not a big one. We need, uh, you know, big concrete buildings and with the big doors that that would let the trucks to come in. The seating cranes and, you know, uh, big power supplies, uh, those are not... That's more than a university can provide. Yes. So that is one of the things we need at this stage. To start up small companies, it's currently possible. It is publicly funded, publicly supported also that many of the ventures, capitals can now invest. But from the real startups to a mid-size, like 100 to uh, you know, 500 people, that is sometimes called a death valley. To make a small size to mid-size, it needs a big facilities and its infrastructures. And for the nuclear facilities, particularly, it is very difficult. That seems to be the case in a lot of a lot of different industries. Like you were mentioning, the the, the Valley of Death. It it's too late to get the tiny check sizes. It needs a lot of capital, but it's too early to do like discounted cash flow evaluations. It's a challenge. Yes, but in Japan there is a lot of you know interesting facilities. It's publicly funded or even private big companies own that kind of big facilities. If startups can share and use those, those facilities, we can make some interesting technical achievement, even innovation. So, so far, Japan has been very good in the fabrication technology. We are still trying to make this technology to be available for the world. But also, that we do have facilities for mid-size, large-size production. So that can be shared with the startup companies. Yeah, and, and recently so many Japanese universities and large enterprises are prioritizing startup partnerships and startup spin-outs, and so hopefully we will see a lot of progress in that direction. Yeah, yes, I hope so. But again, the prioritize is the key word that can work either way. Uh, we still need the diversity of the technology, if we would select one now. <laughs> that may be okay, but we may lose that chance to, to be something interesting. Well, listen, Satoshi, thank you so much for sitting down with me today. I, I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. And I enjoy talking with you very much. Thank you. And we're back. So in case you haven't noticed, I'm, I'm kind of in love with the whole idea of fusion energy. On paper, it seems perfect. It's nearly unlimited, relatively clean energy. But... The excited physics geek in me is tempered by the skeptical investor in me, who is quick to point out, j just like Satoshi did, that there are a lot of important problems that have yet to be solved. Even in the ITER project we discussed, although it has a huge and unquestionable scientific value, since that international effort to build the fusion reactor began in 2013, the budget has ballooned from 6 billion euros to 22 billion euros, and the completion date has been pushed back from 2016 to 2025. 
and further delays and budget overruns are considered to be very likely. No one said this was going to be easy or inexpensive. Kyoto Fusioneering's business model as a small startup playing this space is, frankly, a brilliant one. So much about eventual fusion reactor design is unknown, but by being the first to bring precision engineering to reactor components and subsystems as they become stable enough to do so, the company is able to both help push the research forward and to establish themselves as an essential part of the fusion energy supply chain. First with the research projects, and eventually commercially. It's not exactly the standard model of selling picks and shovels, since those components are still subject to rapid technology and design shift. But executed well, it's a great strategy for commercializing an emerging technology. So, when will commercial fusion become a reality? Well, as Satoshi points out, we are probably at least 10 to 15 years away from the technology being ready. And after that, it's really about the economics. It will be a question of whether fusion reactors can be constructed and operated to generate electricity more cheaply than other forms of energy. Of course, it's hard to know so far in the future, but the engineering that Kyoto Fusioneering is bringing to the supply chain will play a big role in making that affordable. The road ahead for fusion energy is not an easy one, but I'm rooting for Satoshi and the team at Kyoto Fusioneering, and I think most of humanity is too. It's hard to imagine a better future than one powered by abundant, clean fusion energy. If you want to talk more about nuclear fusion and the role startups are playing in our energy transition, Satoshi and I would love to hear from you. So come by disruptingjapan.com slash show 214 and let's talk about it. And hey, if you enjoy Disrupting Japan, share a link online or just tell people about it. Disrupting Japan is free forever and letting people know about it is the absolute best way you can support the podcast. But most of all, thanks for listening. And thank you for letting people interested in Japanese startups know about the show. I'm Tim Romero. And thanks for listening to Disrupting Japan.